Um, our association is uh, particularly grateful to His Excellency, Dr. Fayani, Governor of Akin State, Chairman of the Nigerian Governors Forum, a fellow alumni of the Harvard Kennedy School for accepting to serve as keynote speaker at this maiden edition theme, Harnessing Africa's Demographic Dividend for Peace, Security, and Productivity through Investment in Youth. Africa has the youngest population in the world, and according to the United Nations, 6 million youths aged between 15 and 24 lived in Africa in 2015, presenting nearly 20% of Africa's population, making up one fifth of the world's youth population. By 2030, Africa's share of youth in the world is forecast to increase to 42% and will continue to grow throughout the remainder of the 21st century, more than doubling by current levels by 20. In the face of it, this is good, especially when compared um, to many developing nations like Japan, Canada, and even the United Kingdom, where they have had to import, they've had to import manpower to meet their domestic needs, their aging, uh, and to manage their aging population, and actively uh, encouraging emigration from around the world. This seeming demographic advantage in Africa is, however, meaningless, given the rather suboptimal investments in education skills development, and healthcare by Africa's governments, which has culminated in illiteracy, unemployment, poverty, drug abuse, poor health status, and low skills among Africa's youth. These conditions have precipitated frustration, anger, and insecurity across Africa, and threatened the sovereignty of some nations and continents, where collectively, youth account for 60% of all of Africa's jobs, according to the United Nations. Of Africa's nearly 420 million youths aged between 15 and 35, one third are unemployed and discouraged. Another third are vulnerably employed, and only one in six is in wage employment. Youth face roughly double the unemployment rate of adults, with significant variation by country according to the African development bank. And the truth is that only very little progress can be made in an atmosphere of despondency. Fueled by insecurity and opportunities. Policymakers and citizens must therefore redouble efforts to find the right policy mix to catalyze Africa's industrial and manufacturing sectors to provide jobs and ignite the productive capacity of its young population. We will shortly introduce you to Governor Fahimi, who is himself an alumni of the Canadian School. I want to take this liberty to challenge fellow alumni whether in or out of government by asking, what are we doing with our Harvard education? Like all of you, I am truly inspired. I'm proud of my Harvard education and cherish the opportunity and privilege at the institution. We must recognize that with the privilege of attending one of the most prestigious schools in the world comes great responsibility. We must pause from time to time to reflect and remind ourselves why we invested so much time and fiscal resources to attend Harvard University? Was it simply for prestige or for access to the tools, resources, and networks that help us reimagine, shape, and transform our world? Or whatever your motivation was for attending Harvard University, duty now beckons. And this is definitely not the best time for our continent. Therefore, as beneficiaries of the Harvard education, its accompanying networks and pedigree, the burden of responsibility is upon us to do all we can to lead in navigating our new world with all the challenges by contributing our knowledge, skills, experience, network, resources, towards transforming our continent, society, and communities for the best. For this to happen, we must make the commitment and get involved in leveraging the platform provided by the Harvard Kennedy School Association. It's been estimated that well over a thousand Nigerians have benefited from a combined executive and full-time degree Harvard, Harvard Kennedy School education. This number presents a significant opportunity for us to make our voices heard across our continent. Nations, federal, state, local government, 
and legislative levels, as well as in the private sector and civic spaces. It is a well-known fact that a good number of our fellow alumni are in positions of authority and influence, while some occupy the highest echelons of their professions and enterprises. Unfortunately, neither the Harvard Kennedy School Alumni Association of our continent nor our countries have enjoyed the full benefits of this large reservoir of knowledge and experience because our membership has not been as active as it is association is therefore that with this middle edition of the Africa Dialogue series, we would awaken the consciousness of our fellow alumni to the fact that citizens and government alike have important roles to play in nation building. I'd like to thank Governor Fine and the panelists, of course, once again, ignoring our invitation, and look forward to a very robust conversation in the next hour and a half. Thank you very much, and uh, we're good to go. I'd therefore like to invite the moderator to please take over. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Frank Weke. Um, we would like to proceed immediately through the program by explaining to you a few housekeeping rules. We'll try to keep as much as possible to the time. We will not exceed the time set here. We would therefore be engaging uh, these rich uh, panelists we have, uh, starting with the keynote speaker, His Excellency, Dr. Kadi Fayemi, the Executive Governor of Bekiti State and Chairman of the Nigerian Governors Forum who has most kindly given us his assurances that he will not only make his speech, but spend some time with us here um, while we discuss this important issue, which he also considers a very critical one, given his background in terms of working in development agencies across the world up till now. The panelists that will be discussing uh, his presentation includes um, uh, Miriam Booker Hazen, a poet, motivational speaker, and an entrepreneur, someone who has use that thought to channel uh, the, the beautiful energy we have in the country. We also have with us uh, Jude Abaga, popularly known as MI, who is more of an entrepreneur than uh, what most people would even understand. He will share with us his experiences, both actively on the front of pushing the youth agenda and in his own, uh, in his own uh, experience in running an entrepreneurial service. The, the third panelist will be Uche Pedro, the founder and CEO of Bella Niger, who is of more things, one of those uh, Nigerians who came back from the diaspora to work in the country uh, in Nigeria because she believes so. The focus of the conversation is entirely around the young people in Africa. These young people are confronted with multiple challenges, ranging from uh, economies that grew but could not create sufficient jobs, uh, the issues of are we producing more people than the economy can provide? But most importantly, a, a continent that has faced the wrong end of the global financial economic crisis that has led to sluggish growth post the crisis, in part arising from adverse uh, uh, economic policies and poor commodity uh, uh, prices from their output. The COVID-19 pandemic just added another layer to the challenge. Africa is the only region where the youth board will continue to grow in the foreseeable future, presenting both an opportunity to reap the demographic dividend and an imminent time bomb and threat to social cohesion, as well as massive migration in search of opportunities if appropriate policies are not implemented to harness the dividend. That said, statistics show that Africa's youth unemployment rate is indeed the lowest in the world compared to Africa, where we have high informality and poor social protection schemes where people are forced to do petty jobs to survive. That data, which I cited, came from the ILO, which also showed us that it is important that rather than use the unemployment data, the more appropriate data for Africa will be employment to population ratio, which shows that around two in every five young people of working age are in some form of employment in Africa decline between 2012 and 2018. This conversation we hope to have should enable us to engender conversations around what are those policies that ha have to take place to really maximize the opportunity rather than focus on the negativity which Africa is seemingly in right now. Most importantly, we recall that in 2013, the African Union passed uh, the AU2063 policy anchored around seven major pillars. It is important that countries within Africa should develop their own program around it. They look at the alignment of that particular objective 
and those objectives run by individual African states reflect a disconnect. Recently, the 10-year plan, which is 2013 uh, to 2023, uh, should be out. The update will be out, and we'll look at that. To help us in this conversation, we'd like to invite the keynote speaker to address us for the next 20 minutes on his thoughts, his views, but most importantly, to share his perspective from Africa's uh, dominant economy in terms of population, Nigeria. It gives me great pleasure to invite His Excellency, Dr. Kaldi Fayemi, to give us his address. Thank you, sir. Today's event is another effort to stimulate robust conversation and inspire solutions to topical challenges confronting us as a people. It needs no repeating that your theme for today's event is not only succinct, but relevant to our, our quest to finding solutions to the hydra headed challenge of unemployment, social upheavals, and criminality that have been associated with the ever expanding population of young people in Nigeria and Africa as a whole. Mr. Chairman, permit me to quickly make a rundown of the demographic description of Africa so as to properly situate our understanding and focus our views as we go into details in this paper. According to credible data from the United Nations, the World Bank, Africa Development Bank, Worldometer, and other organizations that are interested in population studies, Africa has continued to see a geometric population increase since the last 50 years. For example, the total population of Africa has at 1960 was estimated at about 200 million. But as of December 8, 2020, the United Nations estimation put Africa's population at 1,354,376,737 people, representing roughly 17% of the world's population. A United Nations data further projects that the population of Africa may reach 2.5 billion by 2050, representing 26% of the world's total. It is even estimated that Africa's population may hit 4.5 billion by 2100, and that will make Africa two of the world population, compared to 100 million people. But today, in about 60 years, where it will be noted that a great percentage of increase in the European population can also be attributed to the continuing aggressive migration from African and Asian countries under the period of review. And to further draw home the point of our population growth in Africa, we can see that as of 1960, Nigeria's population was estimated at 45.14 million. But in latest release by the National Population Commission two days ago, Nigeria is estimated to be about 206 million people. The nation has more than quadrupled since 1960. Generally, it is projected that Africa may have about 2.5 billion inhabitants by 2100 and will be the fourth largest continent with about 40% of the world residing in it. In terms of size, Africa has a total land mass of 30 million and 65,000 square meters and population density of 45 per square kilometer. Fertility rate of sub Saharan Africa is 4.6% per woman, with net migration record of minus 463.024 average birth rate of 32.8% and 2.5% yearly change in population. Some of the factors have been attributed to the population explosion, uh, and some of the things that have been advanced for these include improved healthcare system, which has brought about lower child mortality and increased life expectancy, general negative attitude to the use of contraceptives, high level of poverty and lack of education. And when you look at this and you contextualize the emerging uh, demographic issues around Africa's population, the number one issue is youth bulge and unemployment. Africa's demography indicates a highly youthful population with the median age of 15 to 24 years, constituting around a quarter of the population. 
generally young people between age of 15 to 35 constitute more than 60% of the population. This segment of the population is made up of young people who are still in school or who are undergoing some training or are jobless. Accordingly, it is not surprising that 60% of unemployment in Africa is within this demographic. ILO reports of 2016 revealed that 70% of African workers are the working poor. This is because of, of underemployment that is prevalent all over Africa. A great number of the people who have been working for decades continue to see themselves as underemployed because of poor pay, lack of job satisfaction, or wrong job placement. The implication of this is very profound on the level of poverty in Africa. While it is bad that an average of 10 to 12 million youth join the labor market yearly on the continent with very slim hope of being gainfully employed, many of those already employed remain unsatisfied with their employment status. As bad as this number is, many of the youth who throng our sprawling urban centers for a means of livelihood are without employable skills or knowledge. It is no wonder, therefore, that African society is beset with a myriad of social problems, such as drug abuse, high crime rate, adolescent pregnancy, banditry, kidnapping, transborder crimes, sectarian bigotry, ethnic militancy, internet fraud, amongst others, and one can go on and on. There's also a growing level of illiteracy, or uh, there's a growing level of literacy. Literacy level presents a varied situation from one region to another, but the countries with the highest level of illiteracy remains in Africa. While most of the North African nations have impressive literacy levels, over one fifth of children between ages six and 11 are out of school, followed by one third of youth between the ages of about 12 and 14. A UNESCO data accounts that almost 60% of youth between 15 to 20 years in Africa are out of school. Academic achievement in terms of success in aptitude examination, comparatively speaking, is very poor. And this has often led to many dropping out of schools. Many remain illiterate even with nine years of basic education that is now almost universally compulsory. It must, however, be noted that even within the 46 sub-Saharan African nations, literacy levels differs considerably. In contrast, uh, in Nigeria, for example, national adult literacy level as of 2018 was 62.02% of the population. Youth literacy level is, however, far better with about 80%. This data is based on national average. A more realistic position would be to look at the literacy level on the state to state basis and zone to zone basis. While some states have as much as 98% literacy level among the young adult population, other states have as low as 30%. And the average of this will suggest 64% nationally. What we also notice with this imagined demographic issue is gender inequality. Although some progress has been made in most African countries, in addressing issues of around gender inequality, the challenge remains with half of the population as female, but very low representation in key decision-making organs of the society. Women continue to face discrimination that has hampered the kind of the benefits that the population should have uh, uh, gained from. Urban boom versus rural desolation. Some 60 years ago, about 70% of African population lived in the rural areas, mostly in their native communities. Today, the statistics has inversed. We now have about 70% of the population living in the urban centers, with most of the urban dwellers living a squalid life in urban ghettos. Whilst the cities are overflowing with desperate people who pour in from the rural areas, the rural areas are becoming ghost towns with a continuously dwindling and aging population of residents. The impact of this on agricultural production have been very devastating. With most rural farmers now past their prime in age and techniques, the young people who should take their place and do better 
because of modern education uh, and technology are in the streets of the cities struggling to make ends meet. What is obvious in the rural urban migration is that the migrants are mainly young people who are in search of better lives in the cities. And we saw that in the recent uh, experience that we all encountered with the NSAS uh, uh, movement. Income inequality is also a major problem, uh, even for those who are in uh, uh, employment. Despite some obvious economic growth in Africa, which has led to expansion in economic activities and job creation, one of the challenges that face Africa remains the level of income disparity and general poor remuneration system. It is said that the top 10% of the income level earns more than 30 times of the 50% of the bottom earners in Africa. Consequently, one of the reasons why there is a high poverty level in Africa can be traced to a poor pay structure, which has impoverished many despite working for many years. It has been therefore argued that growth in per capita income of a nation is not enough to lift the mass of the poor out of poverty. It is apparent that the remuneration system concentrates hugely at the cliff of the pyramid, where those at the top get paid excessively, while those at the rung of the pyramid can barely survive with what they earn. This makes wealth to be unfairly distributed along the social ladder. And this has even been brought into a sharper focus with the COVID-19 pandemic. The low-income earners have continued to find it even harder to survive in the face of national and international economic downturn. Is a huge population a cause or a blessing? Each po population could be as beneficial as it could be injurious to a nation. As we have seen from other jurisdictions, big population is one of the characteristics of big economies because one needs a huge population to have a prosperous market that can feed industrial production. In fact, Europe, which has similar characteristics with Africa in terms of population, understood the place of a big market and came together through the European Union to create a big market that can absorb their industrial productivity. The rise and dominance of the United States and the imagined influence of China, India, Indonesia and other Asian, uh, Asian nations have to do with the blessing of a significant population that is large enough to sustain domestic consumption and stimulate foreign exports. Therefore, having a big population in itself is more of a blessing than a cause. However, a huge population can also be a source of economic challenges, political instability, and social crises. If the population is made of illiterate, low-skilled, non-productive, and low-income earners. The most important elements of a functional population are the composition of its demographics. This is where the problem with the increasing population of African nation is. The segment of the population that are giving birth to more children are mostly the illiterate and low-income earners who have no means of raising the children. They are churning out in tens of numbers. With about 3% annual population growth rate, clearly the highest in the world, an average economic growth rate of 2.4%, it is clear that inordinate population explosion in Africa is a recipe for economic catastrophe. With the land mass with just about 60% arable, while the impact of climate change is already causing incalculable havoc on land and water bodies, it is obvious that Africa faces a great challenge with an unabated population growth. When people are not suffering from desertification, they're facing serious gully erosion and flooding crises, which have exacerbated the poverty and violent crisis in the continent. The result of this is a continuous migration within Africa, which has led to violent confrontation for land resources. A lot of young African youths are also trying dangerously to escape poverty through illegal but deadly routes to Europe and America for greener pasture. And a lot of these young people have lost their lives in the process of crossing the Mediterranean Sea to Europe. Demographic dividends. For Africa to benefit from demographic dividend, which is described as the economic growth potential that a nation may gain for having 
more people of working age. In practical terms, it suggests that a nation or region that has a youthfully skewed population of working age of 15 to 65 stands to benefit from higher productivity and rapid economic growth. So a youthful population is supposed to be an economic agent of productivity. A youthful population is the potential avenue for consumerism. Creativity and virility of the youth are great economic stimulators, especially in creative industry, where innovation, physical energy, risk, and creativity are the currency of survival. A diverse population of people with complex social, cultural, and religious diversity as Africa provides an immense opportunity for industrial growth. The low wage level provides an opportunity for investors to take advantage of low production costs and make huge returns. The enormity of the benefits that exist in Africa for investment accounts for other analysts often do Africa as the next frontier of economic development. Finally, Africa needs a population policy and a commission to plan the future and the implication of 40% of world's population living in the world's most challenged continent in the next eight decades. The security architecture of African nations is generally weak to confront the emerging security problems in the continent. And there's need to foster better intelligence sharing, joint missions activities, and resource sharing. In conclusion, I hold the view that economic prosperity will guarantee peace and engender development on our continent. And I really want to thank you, uh, our Kennedy School Alumni Association, for bringing us together to reflect on this all important issue. Uh, and I'm thankful and I hope the, uh, to benefit from the panelists and their own thoughts. But we really must see this issue as a wake up call to African leaders about the enormity of the challenges ahead. I thank you for listening and God bless you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, sir. And without much further ado, I want to acknowledge that you only spent two minutes outside your normal regulated time. Um, so um, we are still here. Let me quickly provide a summary of what you said. You sought in your presentation, the keynote speaker, His Excellency, sought to establish the linkage between population and unemployment vis a vis social deviancy and the pressures that are created on things like social services, healthcare, housing, and education. Indeed, we, I'm sure because of the limited time, he did not spend as much time on addressing the multiple fallouts out of that gap on the pressure on education. But he mentioned issues around dropout, the criminality element, the alignment, and perhaps indeed the closures of universities and its impact. But effectively, what he was drawing up in the linkage was the was the was the drop in productivity of the countries on the continent because of this population. He also addressed the issue about gender inequality. Put bluntly, the cultural disenfranchisement of females in Africa, which is more cultural than anything, but it, but there has been some advancement, but not enough. He also, as a point three, discussed the major issue of income disparity and income inequality especially the impact on rural urban migration, acting as a pressure on existing facilities and infrastructures around. He also, in that point, also mentioned issues around the migrants uh, who are mainly young people, as should be expected. On the fourth point, he also mentioned the consequence of this as a, uh, on the wealth spread of which per capita income uh, actually carries a disguised uh, notion that covers up issues around poverty and shallow wealth distribution. As the fifth point, His Excellency addressed if the huge population is a cause or a blessing. He surmised that he believes it is a blessing, and, and then he discussed issues around harness in the population. Uh, the first round of questions uh, for me will be to the panelists. Uh, I will start in no particular order and call on the, the gentleman, uh, starting with Miriam, and then Jude and Uche to comment on His uh, Excellency's presentation from their own perspective in about five minutes. But I must say something about what he said about a cause or a blessing. It behoves for me to explain to you that the positives, for every positive he mentioned, there are negatives in it. He mentioned a huge market. Um, this 
this market has a, is a positive, but the negative from it is that disposable income, where disposable income is low, the positive about a huge market means that you have a fraction market in itself. It cannot support things like retail and what have you. Secondly, he mentioned uh, uh, a positive also is the diaspora community, which is an excellent point because that delivers remittances. He also speaks to the issue about migration. He allows for the foreign uh, uh, embassies to negotiate very well. But what he, he has not yet addressed is that uh, up to recently, we have only seen low skilled income earners over there compared to global economies where you have highly skilled people who are migrants who actually support the economy, which also explains the, uh, in terms of the quality of your remittances as well. Uh, the other side about it is the criminal enterprise that has emerged also out of the diaspora community. The third positive, which I would just like to say before I allow the panelists to speak, is the composition of the demographic itself. Uh, the key point here is that this, for me, is one of the most important points about the composition of that demographic. And he's a premise that inordinate population growth uh, is, uh, happens when you therefore have more population growth from your low income grade, which also creates uh, a number of problems for us. Um, but I'm sure that in terms of that is also the issue related to land and the cultural issues around where people give back because we needed them to go into farming, but farming has changed. Um, uh, as I go ahead to call on the panelists to then give their reaction, it suffice that I should acknowledge that we have in the audience some distinguished members of the public and uh, citizens who have different issues and have been communicating some of their thoughts. We'll be taking them and also passing them to the panelists. So without much further ado, may I call on Miriam, uh, Jude, and Uche in that order to react to His Excellency's uh, presentation. Thank you, Miriam. Okay, so we, if we don't have Miriam, I think we have Jude on the line. Jude? Good morning, everyone. Uh, Your Excellency, it's good to see you again. Good morning, Jude. Um, and uh, <laughs> morning, sir. And everyone um, from this esteemed uh, alumni family, um, thank you so much. Uh, Uncle Frank has been has really been patient with me on my case to getting me here. It's such an honor to be here uh, and to talk about such an important issue. Uh, as as a youth, even though I'm tethering towards the uh, the limitations of that uh, definition, um, I, I I remember what my journey was to get here um, and how and how my story starts with my father who is a, a, a child in the village in a part of Taraba called Piri and it's a walking distance from Cameroon over some hills and the stories that he would tell me about how they would chase rats you know in, in, the, in, in, the, in their well I guess in their environment in what you could call the wild there and and his journey to Jaws and, you know, a, a small pastor's family and, and my journey from there to, to getting to, uh, to uh, Michigan and going to school there and coming back to Nigeria and starting my new journey and leaving Jaws to move to Lagos, which was even more culture shock for me than going to America um, and uh, stopping by halfway in Abuja uh, on that journey and, and spending some time there and sort of, you know, I had a record called in my career called Africa Rapper Number One. And I remember during that period, every time I would drop in the East, people would start speaking Igbo to me because they thought I was an, an Igbo guy. And, but this blessed privilege and advantage to be able to see the country in all its, in all its glory and all its flaws and to truly understand what the life of the average young Nigerian feels like on a day to day and, and, that, and that dichotomy between um, hope and helplessness, that, that consistent feeling that most young people carry around with them every day. And if I were to add anything, I mean, uh, His Excellency has spoken so well and put it in context in terms of the numbers and what we should be aware of. And, and I hope people weren't, you know- we seem to be struggling with Jews, right? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, but I, I know for most people that we watch, it's not just numbers. But I, I I'll say this, that as, as an opening thought, is that there's a speaker called Simon Sinek who talks about something called the, the infinite game. And what he says about the infinite game is that sometimes 
when people are playing a game, they think they're playing a finite game. And a finite game has rules, it has an ending, it has a time when it's done. And when I think about that, it makes me re reflect on the fact that the journey towards development has to be approached like an infinite game. Like an infinite game has no end, it has no, and, and, and I'll tell you my own frustration about, again, this, this tension between the two. As part of the entertainment industry, I, you find that when you, you're, you're interfacing with HNIs or, or government or the banking industry, they keep asking you to present yourself in a finite way. And they keep saying to yourself that if you don't have a PNL that makes sense at the end of 2021, this isn't worth investing in. And I want to slam my head against the wall and say, no, we're playing the infinite game. We're fighting for the future of Africa. We're fighting for the future of our young people. It doesn't matter what the PNL says next year or the year after or the year after. What matters is that our young people don't turn towards 419 and don't turn towards, towards crime or don't try to make it to Europe by crossing you know, the Sahara and going through us that. And that they have, they have basketball courts where they can, they have tracks where they can run. They have studios where they can run and make music and that young people like 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 myself and, and Uche that have just bootstrapped it and created something from nothing aren't overbogged with taxes and long tax codes that we don't understand and and, and, and don't have to deal with insecurity in a real I'm part of a project where we just donated to to, to a young uh, DJ who lost everything in the recent events with insecurity and all these issues and that that the cry would finally get to the people in power that, that we need to play the infinite game when it comes to Africa. And, and maybe those are my, you know, my opening thoughts that I wanted to, sh to share and, and pass the mic back to our, our moderator. But again, it's such an honor to be here and I look forward to you know, learning, listening, and being part of an engaging conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jude. Um, I would, uh, I would, would uh, summarize to you that uh, I like the emotions you show, shared in there. Uh, like I always tell people, there is a crisis between funding, which the emotions have to conflict with data. And also the fact of uh, investing and valuation is that uh, whereas in developed economies, you can value into the expectations of tomorrow. In a developing economy, you have to use both, which is to track record and possibilities. And as such, the Nigerian financial system, for example, and even within Africa, Nigeria particularly, is premised around a different culture like what you have in Kenya and South Africa. And I'm sure that the, uh, His Excellency will be able to provide some context as to how to address the, uh, those frustrations and uh, in numbers and how the state governments have been working around it. Uh, Uche, you came back into the country from Canada and um, Nigerians are moving up to Canada. Uh, do you want to speak to the His Excellency's uh, presentation? Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm really honored to be here. And thank you, His Excellency, for an excellent and very thorough um, keynote. All right. So taking off from a certain angle, migration away from Nigeria. I, as you said, I lived in Canada and you know, recently came back from Cambridge as well. And I'm here. And speaking as somebody who works with a lot of young people, I work with a lot of amazing young people. In the, this is just in the last year, two young people who have worked with us, in fact, three have been on the Forbes list, have gotten full scholarships to Oxford. Another person has just gotten into the top writing program in the world. That is just my own team and my own company. So just imagine the whole of Nigeria. We have amazing young people here and the world is seeking out the best. They are offering those opportunities to people who are the best. And I will never ever tell any young person to not take up that opportunity. During the pandemic, there were a few bright spots that, you know, cheered us up. Even at Bella Niger, we said, look, let's look for good news. <laughs> Too many bad things are happening. And what were those bright spots most of the time? oh, this Nigerian has attained this position in the legal system in Canada. Oh, the vaccine, this Nigerian who is working at Yale is a team leader in the fight to get a vaccine in time for COVID-19. So it shows that this system is working. People are going out there and they're actually being successful. 
And many of these people, if they share their journey in Nigeria, yes, many of them even attended Nigerian universities. Yes, Nigerians have such a strong tie to our country. Our culture is so rich, our country is beautiful, but they are thriving and blooming and blossoming over there. So in terms of solutions, we all know what the problems are, but in terms of solutions, what should we do right now? I would say as people head out in the diaspora, we should continue to keep our hands open for them to come back and contribute to the growth of the country, come back and make a positive change within our space. Um, when I say come back, it doesn't necessarily mean that anybody has to move into the country, no. It means that we should open ways for them to dialogue. It means that we should open pathways for them to vote. This is something that people have been arguing for. We do not have voting available for people outside the country. So this, these are some really key areas that I would like to raise regarding that. Thank you very much, Uche. I would like, therefore, quickly to go to Miriam as we wrap up this uh, first set of uh, opening talks on the, on the Kido speaker's address. Miriam. Good morning, everyone. Um, sorry, my network has thrown me in and out. Um, good morning. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I would like to make a, a comment on what the what His Excellency the Governor said in terms of in, increasing investment in university basic education. And why I want to say something on that is because um, I, I think, think it, it has affected me directly because before I even knew that I could do poetry in school, there was no um, sense of guidance except coming from um, my mother, who thought otherwise, um, a lot of people would just see it as, oh, she likes to talk too much and things like that. And so he mentioned um, guidance and counseling, which I believe is very important. But in addition to that, I, I feel like there should be some sort of um, long-term integration between vocational education and the conventional school. And creativity should not be treated as a by thing or some um, extracurricular activity, but rather looking at it holistically as becoming a part of um, school. And then um, also, um, that, I think that would help strengthen creative institutions because the creative industry is the second largest provider of um, job opportunities. And also, I think we should also look at what is relative to a youth in a particular state or a particular um, country. Um, rather than generalizing, because what works for this person might not necessarily um, work for the other person. So yeah, that's my thought on that. Thank you very much. Um, His Excellency, I believe that in order to keep this uh, conversation going and keep you engaged, it is important that I provide context here. Uh, before, and I, I hope that you will therefore provide answers to that, and then we'll then take uh, more questions. Most importantly, we have very senior members also in government and in private enterprise also here who are also sending questions, which I would like to make available to you. Uh, it's not too often we find you around. Here, here are the few contextual issues around what uh, my three panelists have said. Do you believe that there is a, a challenge with communications, i.e. the feedback loop between what government is seeking to do and what, uh, I mean, African countries are specifically uh, the Nigerian government and the citizens themselves. Because it's obvious that uh, when you look at all the plans on paper, they look good and you, you hear leaders come out. But then what the people are saying is almost different. It's almost like it's a different game entirely. That is one question. The second one would be about the apparent and obvious mismatch between the nexus I established earlier on, which is between population and unemployment. Because there's a missing middle there. The missing middle there is the educational system. If you took a look at the jobs which people are looking for in Africa, and if you look at what the African governments talk about, they talk about the culture, they talk about manufacturing. But if you look at this, uh, what, for example, the World Economic Forum issued in the future of jobs and skills in Africa, the jobs they are looking for, and the top 20 jobs that will be available for the next 20 years, have it, there's a dichotomy between what those jobs are and what the educational system is structured to deliver currently. And those kind of new jobs are being taken over by non-state actors right now. You have hubs, you have innovation centers, you have 
people creating sandboxes. And as such, it seems as if the government's focus on education would perpetuate unemployment because you're going to produce people who could not be employed. And I think you may want to speak to that. Um, the third point, sir, is the issue around uh, the continental plans, whereby each country is expected to develop its own plans for itself. And then when you take a look at an example of ACTA, for example, and uh, uh, start and stop that uh, occurred up till December, where we now have a full ratification in place, how do you think the government most positioned to allow the Nigerian youth to benefit? You already have from the entertainment industry how Nigerians are able to work with each other across Africa. Uh, most uh, entertainment industry people have been doing virtually everything that after six to do, both from uh, the Nollywood, both from music, both from uh, creative, uh, those other aspects of creative arts, and indeed in sports. So how do you position that and explain it in ways we can understand? And lastly, I must ask this before the major questions come from. How does African government use crisis to send a message um, um, and and, and indeed, who message does this say? If, for example, you can lean on the current answers situation that occurred in Nigeria, and then comment on the actions that have taken subsequent to that. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Okay. Um, quite uh, a lengthy one there, Femi. But let me actually return to uh, Jude, Uche, and Miriam first. I'll, I'll take the, the points you've, you've, you've raised. Uh, because I think that they're very central to the discourse. But I do agree with Jude that we should see this as a journey rather than a destination. It's an infinite game. Uh, one of the books that made the most impression on me as a young person is Ben O'Kree's book, The Famished Road. And those of us who have read Famished Road will know that the story is about a, a road that is being constructed by people and every generation continues the construction of that road. But what is critical in any notion of a journey rather than a destination is to at least see little acorns become tall oaks, progress, development rather than reversal. So as long as there are significant milestones that we're making in our quest towards a journey, then I don't have a problem with the notion of an infinite game as Judas described it. But there must still be milestones. There must still be evidence of progress on the journey. Uh, in certain instances, I, I think we've not always seen that in our own environment, or we've not always interpreted some of the things we see as progress. Uh, 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 because technology has sort of changed our situation completely. But, but, but I do believe that it's important that those who are in policy making, policy implementation, uh, must contextualize development and see concrete steps such as uh, uh, Judas described as uh, insight into that infinite journey that we, we have. And on migration, I totally agree with you that we must not take a completely negative view of young people who, because of the limited opportunities that are here, would rather uh, jump ship uh, and, and, and get involved uh, uh, in, in the journey towards making themselves better, the, 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 the greener pastures, as we say. Uh, I certainly can't discourage young people from doing that. Uh, I lived outside the country for the better part of 15 years before I returned. And at least the fact that some of us went out and then came back uh, itself is a positive. And I absolutely agree with you, Jay, that brain drain does not necessarily become brain gain when everybody returns home. And there are different ways of returning home. One of the programs we used to have in the Kitty during my first time is what we call Ikogos, the Graduate Summer School. And a couple of my colleagues who are in academia in uh, Europe and America, they come spend their summer 
months here training uh, uh, our graduate students uh, uh, in, in our local university uh, on research methodology, on uh, uh, materials, on writing skills, and a whole range of stuff. So they come like that. Now we have what we call a kitchen knowledge zone in which we have envisioned the situation in which many of our uh, academic and uh, uh, public policy celebrities, entrepreneurs outside the country uh, come home, spend some time with our people who are uh, keen on innovation hubs, on startups, and, and help them uh, 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 with mentoring, with uh, uh, training and support. So I do agree that we can take advantage of our huge diaspora, particularly the professional diaspora, uh, beyond just remittances. Remittance is good, but skills development, exchanging ideas, and um, building partnerships for progress is something that we should pay particular attention to. And I know that a lot of us are doing that. And, and, and uh, as to Miriam's point, uh, that we, we must ensure that it's not just a demand for universal basic education for young people and guidance and counseling uh, so that we put them in the right direction, uh, but also that we let them see the value of uh, non-standardized educational uh, uh, training uh, or what normally we'll be learning by rote uh, in, in the curriculum. We need to step outside of those curriculum and let kids that don't want to follow the normal route not see themselves as outcasts, but uh, are helped to develop those skills in, in, a, in, a, in, in a more productive manner. I, I agree with, with all that. As to your three issues, um, Femi, don't we hear what citizens are saying uh, when we are in public office? Why do policies differ from what the young people are saying, ordinary people are saying? I, I don't know to what extent that is true. Uh, we, we don't form policies exclusively. Uh, at least in, in my state, we don't do that. Our young people are very much involved in what we're doing. When we decided to crash the right of way tariff in a Kitty state uh, in order to increase our broadband access, it was because we noticed that a lot of our younger people are in the innovation hub and they are keen to develop their uh, IT skills, startup programs, what have you. And we felt the way to do this was to attract those who want to invest in this sector. And we're not legal, so automatically we would need to add something on top for them to, to, to find a kitty attractive. And as I speak, because of the crash of our right of way tariff, MTN is laying uh, fiber optic cables uh, around our state. And other states are also benefiting from this. So states are responsive, much more responsive than uh, uh, people imagine them to be. So it's important to just find out precisely what they're doing in that regard. You also talked about the, uh, the, the, the mismatch. Uh, and you are absolutely right. The reason why we have that mismatch between the jobs of the future and the current training we have is our traditional notion of education. Growing up, Femi, you and I were subjected to these notion of success. If you're gonna to go to university, you must study medicine, architecture, accountancy, or if you don't do that, you're not successful. Your parents just see you as a, an unserious child. But now, I, I, I actually saw that study that you talked about, the World Economic Forum, Jobs of the Future Index. And, and when you look at it, it is jobs of a uh, uh, web designer, uh, the creative manager of uh, uh, entertainment. Those are the jobs of the future. Automation. And many of us, if you have a child, who, if you have a child who wants to 
to do a, what, what's that cartoon like uh, animation? You will say, are you okay? What's that? Is that a job? Or you just want to use my money, you want to waste my money to be, that's the way we were brought up. But our kids are making it clear to us now that, that that's your generation. That's what I want to do. And many of us are having to concede to them that, okay, go ahead, do your animation, uh, go ahead, do your music and become David Deo or Tiwa Savage or Burner Boy and make money. That, oh, am I? Oh, am I? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's the reality we're faced with. And we need to rise up to that challenge. We need to respond to the demand of our environment and make sure that governance also responds to this, not just from a perspective of old school knowledge and uh, 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 insistence on particular professions that are deemed to be successful and your, all your that, that are not your successful. What, yeah, you, what, what you read in school is your not relevant. Permit me if I brought it. I, I just needed you to address that point because you see, uh, not only have you been an advocate of that particular policy for so many years, so I'm speaking to the converted already. The challenge for the youth is to understand why is it so difficult for us to make that transition in Nigeria? What is the thing that is holding us back? That's what we would like to know, sir. What is holding us back is that some of these things are largely driven by, by government. Uh, one of the reasons responsible for that is that we have this over-centralized arrangement in our educational system. Curriculum has to be determined centrally. Uh, and the creativity that you require that must respond to these yearnings of our younger population, it's not there. So we need to loosen up. We need to let uh, our manpower, our human resources agenda be driven largely by the skill set required in order to improve certain elements. I mean, if we, we, we used to have what, what, what was known in the past as a national manpower board, if you remember. And one of the jobs of the manpower board was in, in 10 years is are required. But at the local level, we need to know what will make us tick. For example, in a Kitty state, we're very clear that we can be all things to all people. We're known mostly for two things in, in Nigeria, agriculture, and education. That is what people will tell you when you hear of an Ekiti man. They say, ah, those professors, uh, and to oh, those farmers. Yes, we, we are both. But we don't just want to have education for its own sake by, by just acquiring degrees at the speed of life. No, we want education for wealth creation, for job satisfaction. And that's what informed our starting a knowledge zone. That's what informed our focus on vocational and technical education right now. So that at the end of the day, we can tackle the unemployment challenge that we're faced with. And at the same time, the job satisfaction that people want. Because as I said in my presentation, even those who have jobs now, they're not happy. They're still looking for another job. They're still they're underemployed because they don't have job satisfaction. So you need to really help people get the best out of what they want. On your third point about uh, African free trade uh, agreement, well, for us in Nigeria, this is not new. We were part of the ECOWAS free market. But what that turned us to was a dumping ground for all manner of things. So this is the challenge. How do we achieve the full benefit of a free trade zone without undermining our local industry. I, I think that is a challenge we face. Yes, our, our large population is a vector <laughs> that attracts people to come and trade with us. But how much of our own materials are getting out there? That's not necessarily 
a complete... Is, is that not a productivity question within the, uh, the subject of competitive advantage rather than a matter of trade policy? It's partly a productivity question, but also, it's also a protectionism question because there are those who don't want our goods to come into our, to their markets. So we need to tackle both. Okay. The last question, sir, was on the answers uh, before we go to other questions. How do we use a crisis to send a message? And what message has been sent to right now by the government of Nigeria, for example? You know, the other word for crisis uh, in, in uh, Mandarin is opportunity. Uh, and I think for us, clearly, our young people have told us in no uncertain terms that they're not happy that government has not been able to provide them with the opportunities that they would like to see. They see these things, they're on television, they're on social media, they know what is going on in other parts of the world. They see how responsive governments are to the yearnings of the population. And we do owe them a duty to begin to respond to at least those reasonable demands that they make for a good education, that is a right, not a privilege. For accountable governance, okay. for human rights protection. And I think this is something that government must respond to because they are the larger part of our population, but what they also need to get and I, I, um, I, I have to say this, is that they need to really rid themselves of a sense of entitlement. Because nobody gives you this thing, Philly. you have to fight for it. And I'm glad that they're beginning to fight for it. Ultimately, when they start knocking on that door and they break the door open, they would be allowed in. But in breaking it open, they can be uh, they can do it by stealth rather than by brigandage. All of us, okay. at least some of us, have spent our time at the barricades. The better part of my young, younger days, I was also an NSAS protester of sorts, as you know. <laughs> but I, I knew where to stop and where to start negotiating with those in in power and authority. And ultimately, we, 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 we made some progress. Okay, Your Excellency, it is high time I go back to my panelists and I will also be bringing Mr. Frank Wicke in here uh, before we then take questions. There are questions from uh, esteemed members of the public, quite a number of them. So let me go back to the panelists. Let me go back to Jude and then to Uche and to Miriam and then, uh, 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 Mr. Frank Wicke as well. Jude, over to you. Um, yeah, I mean, Your Excellency, it was, it was great to hear your feedback. Um, and, and again, great to be part of this conversation. Um, um, I, I think most young people in Nigeria, I'm, 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 I want to just touch on, on what you were talking about in terms of milestones. I think most uh, young people in Nigeria um, understand that that uh, not just understand but uh, almost at a visceral level require development and require those milestones require that things get better and especially when you look at if you were just to take the sample of Nigerians that get uh, some sort of world-class education and compare them against their compatriots I mean their colleagues across the world like Nigerians are the highest performing, I can't remember exactly the stat, but the highest performing like uh, sub minority in the US. Uh, we conquered basketball, we've conquered globally, we've conquered music globally, we've conquered film, we're just doing amazing. Once you give Nigerians the opportunity, they, 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 they do amazing. And, and this idea of, of the tension between um, on, on, on tracking growth uh, and, and the tension between that and investment. And, and just to, to, to get your maybe more concrete thoughts on, um, 
and, and to the rest of the panel too, but to get more concrete thoughts on, on, on when you have a situation, for instance, where in 2000, there was no music industry and the first people that start don't have any structure around them. And literally, as we speak, even today, that structure is being, is being built every day. And unfortunately, what we're finding is that our top artists, if you take the top 10 or 15 Nigerian artists, majority of their taxes would be paid to foreign, foreign, uh, foreign countries. Um, majority of their workforce would be people that are outside the country. There is some investment in the music business, but the real big investment is coming from outside in. Um, and, and those catalogs gradually, we are, we are selling off our, as, as Europe is returning some of our artifacts, we are giving them the artifacts for the next hundred years or whatever. Uh, people's uh, bulk of my catalog is now themselves under some, you know, some company that is owned by someone else there. And how do we, because it's almost like the burden to prove that the Nigerian youth and their ideas and their capabilities are viable is on the young Nigerian. And so when it comes to things like funding conversations and, and whatever, it's always like, okay, prove to us that what you're doing is viable before we, and without, you know, a, there will be a section of Nigerians that will be able to do this and figure out, but for the larger majority, you have a, a country where they don't have the structure, they don't have the education to be able to articulate what this growth would look like. And because of that, they are completely jumped over every time that it comes to, to investment. And, and the reason why when we talk about we talk about the, 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 the infinite game and, and, and stuff like that, why, why I invoke that, and, and I know you, you spoke to that about the road that you keep building, is that at some point, you know, I, I believe that people that, are, that have access to those resources have to start, have to start almost just, and you see this with angel investing, have to start just actively looking for a way to, to create the next big thing. You see, I mean, look at our tech industry. Again, all the, all the big success stories. When last did you hear that the Nigerian H&I invested $20 million or $10 million in some, in some young tech idea or whatever. It's all coming from outside. And that tension is just something that's hard to deal with. Even for the youth that are at the top, they're struggling to, to have the country believe in it. And by the country, I mean the people that, that have access to power to believe in them. So how, what opportunity does a, a young guy from Joss who's just rapping, you know, with one 10 year old laptop that he's, you know, putting together, what opportunity does that person realistically have in this? Your Excellency, you can go ahead with that. Okay. Um, yes, you, 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 you're right. I, I, I get the picture completely. We, we need to find a, uh, a, a different way of encouraging and mentoring young people to come into um, themselves. Uh, and I like the example you, you gave of, of being consistently asked to prove that what you what, what you're proposing your 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 plan is viable and we see it in the job market when you ask young people to demonstrate experience somebody who is just out of school uh, and you say okay what's your experience of doing this and if you don't have experience uh we're not going to be able to employ you we, we we need to change our ways in doing that uh and we, we need to also develop frameworks that are, the, the, the only way that can happen is outside of government, frankly, because government is such a rigid structure that takes some difficulty. It, it's an elephant. Mm -hmm. So it depends on the side uh, at which you'll be, you're, you're viewing the ele elephant from. You, you need to move away from it and look for a more nimble uh, animal that would best activate the creativity of our young people. Uh, but you also need a lot of cooperative work amongst the successful ones, in my view. What government needs to do is at least get the infrastructure right. 
so that power relations between our creative people here and the producers and marketers abroad can be re, 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 reorganized. Because I think what you're saying also speaks to power relations. We produce the music, somebody markets it and makes more money than the uh, person with the intellectual property. And we need to figure out how to ensure that we protect our intellectual property without losing the marketability of the property. And a lot of our young people are very, very productive, resilient, and uh, uh, we, 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 we need to get more people in the private sector interested in this initiative. And you are right, very few HNIs in our country would fund a young startup that they don't know. Because somebody will say, ah, do you want to just waste your money? But it's beginning to happen. I'm, I'm hearing stories like that. But uh, my friends like Femi will know more of it in the economic uh, <laughs> sector. But I think it, quite, quite a number of people are beginning to, and it's not lack of trust in young people. It's just that people have had their fingers burnt in several initiatives. And that has necessitated a, a suspicious tendency uh, amongst people of means in, in our setting. But we need to divest ourselves of that and try out on some things. Your Excellency, just a and quick I think point the way to do it is to have an innovation you, you fund. Want to... Government must be prepared to set up innovation funds. Uh, well, well, Jude wants to respond to you, but uh, as, you, as Jude responds to you, you may want to step uh, down the idea of the Innovation Fund and address a simple question of intellectual property rights. Uh, the country has not yet put in place the simplest rule of the intellectual property rights. You know that the government did not invest money in creative industry. All it did was give telecoms license and everything spread out from there. All they are asking is if you can provide the establishment platform by providing the intellectual property rights in Nigeria, things of patents, trademarks, and their rights, intellectual rights, that would be the only thing mm -hmm. they would ask for government, mm -hmm. and that would open the doors. Let me hand over to Jude, and then you can take the questions together before we go to Miriam. Yes, Jude. sir. Um, thank you so much. I mean, I, the first time we met, we had such an engaging conversation. Um, your, your, um, your leadership in AKT also um, I wasn't so aware the first time you were in office, but this over this period where you've been in office, you are, it's, it's exciting to see. I think I said so to you last time we spoke, but it's exciting to see following through social media, a lot of the projects you're doing. The question I want to ask sir, is just a sub-question to what I was saying. What is it that you guys are getting right in Equity, where from an outsider looking in, you can start to feel a life and an excitement that is that you can identify if you can speak freely on this that is missing almost everywhere else at the federal level and at state level across the rest of the this because it might be it might you have the experience of being on the end where we are and you have the experience of being in the seat where you are today and for young people that are, are, are constantly interfacing with politicians on billboards on, on in, in magazine ads where they are, they're looking dapper and the, the script is written and everything is perfect. And, and we have to take a, a risk and a leap of faith. You are asking the leadership question, really. Yeah, so let's just put it as it is. Uh, uh, His Excellency, Dr. Fahim. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I, I, I take that as a compliment to you. You said that the last time I, I, I saw you. The, the truth of the matter is that this is my first job in government. Uh, I've never worked in government. Uh, I, uh, I've always worked in academia and civil society. So maybe that has some uh, 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 impact on how I relate with people who are not uh, government people, public servants and civil servants. But I think it's also a realization that leadership is service, it is sacrifice. It's not the office that you occupy or the title that you bear. 
you've got to bring something to the table that has the potential to also bring a lot of people together. So I have young people around me. So I get to hear about what is happening in places I don't get to. I, I may not go on the street to eat corn and bolly and, and all that uh, in the populist sense of a governor. But I, I generally uh, stay very closely to what is going on on the streets. Uh, and that then informs how we shape policy and implement our programs. Uh, maybe that's something that makes us more responsive to the challenges of our environment. But I also do not necessarily agree, Jude, and I'm not being modest here. Uh, I, I think we need to know more about what is happening in different places. Uh, some of my colleagues may be approaching it from different perspectives uh, than I am. Um, I, I think everybody is trying to make a difference in their own environment, but the the, the, the pressure is enormous, the challenges are many, but we need to, and we do a lot of peer learning. That's what I should say. There, there's a lot that we're learning. One of the questions I saw uh, from the, the chat best. group, someone asking about Edo Best, for example. Uh, and, and I know about Edo Best because we also have a similar thing that we're starting with Bridge uh, in Ekiti. And I know Lagos has also started something with Bridge uh, Academy and uh, Nasarawa is planning to do the same. So, so people are interested in improving the quality of, of education in their states. It's just that many people may not know that that's going on because it's not out there in uh, the open except people who are benefiting from it in the states. Okay, so maybe we should go quickly to Miriam and share for, with, from our perspective as to how things are happening in our own uh, area of influence. Miriam. Miriam? Um, hi, sir. Okay, go ahead. Hello, I'm here. Hi, I Sorry, can my hear network you. keeps... Yeah. Um, so, well, for me, I think what we're trying to do now in our own capacity is with the tutoring center where we're trying to um, see younger people. I'm young myself, I'm 23, but I mean, teenagers who um, also have the thirst for that um, other element of art apart from music. And I had the opportunity of meeting MI at um, the Next Level USA um, residency where um, he performed a poem and I, I was in the midst of rappers and I didn't really know much about rap and he made me feel comfortable <laughs> um, a poem. And then I felt like, okay, I can rap too. <laughs> so um, thank you so much, MI, because I didn't have the opportunity to really thank you. That really helps me. Um, so yeah, that's what I have to say about that. But I just have a question that is off that a bit for the governor. Um, and it's in regards to the youth fund working for the youth. And I, I want to take an example using Nigeria. So recently the federal government has launched the 75 billion uh, fund. And a part of me feels like that is targeted towards the middle class people because it takes a me. And then how do you make sure that the grassroots um, youth, whom I would say are uh, mostly not tech savvy or literate to have access to these platforms uh, because sometimes the process can be quite complex for them to understand. And how can they get this fund to work for them, keeping in mind that these people are the same set of people majorly being dissatisfied and feeling that the bias or rather the gap is really there and then they end up turning to other means to fend for themselves. And in most cases, they become a horror uh, to the society at large. And um, you know, these are the people that feel like government has failed them utterly. Excellent. Okay. Do you want me to go? I yes, did sir. that for me. Yes. Yeah. I think it's good so that you, she can she can feel as if you are there because I'm sure Uchi has a series of questions I said to ask you. Okay. So that, let, that, let's that's a quick one. Let, I I agree with Miriam completely. Let me say what we've done in Ekiti. Maybe that is something that can uh, 
explain how to bridge that gap between the middle class youth and the rural uh, youth with limited opportunities. When we were told about the Youth Investment Fund and we were told that they had to register online, what we did was to help put in place places where they can go to and register online, coordinated by our microcredit and enterprise development agency, so that this is not just limited to youth with access and youth who are in the big cities, but also youth in the rural uh, uh, areas are assisted to access the online application process. I, I think that's, that's the, the, the one sure way to deal with it. One cannot say stop online. We're moving in a, 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 a modern world. We have to continue to improve on how to uh, bridge the gap, the digital divide. I spoke about it in my, in my presentation and everything that can help a young person. Almost every yeah. young person in Nigeria has a phone. Very few young people, we have 150 million phones in the country now. So I do not see why that cannot even become a source of jobs for our young people. Agency banking is increasing. Having physical structures ultimately would disappear. The idea that you must have a bank in your community, Union Bank, come and put bank in my, in my village. But the, the, the unnecessary fight between telcos and the banks, uh, the finance uh, industry, on who should control that opportunity that I just spoke about that could lead to so many jobs for younger people is, is what is delaying our migration from this physical banking environment to, uh, if you like, mobile banking environment and mobile financial institutions which I think we need to accelerate. So I, I, instead of arguing that we should stop online processes, I think we should look for a way to expand the opportunities for younger people to have access to such uh, opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mario, are you, you, you seem to be okay? Yes, I am. Fairly. Fairly. Okay, yeah. so let me uh, we'll get back to you. Let me go over to Uche. Uche, you have the, the, the His Excellency's attention, right? Thank you very much. So your last statement was actually a perfect segue into Uche. what I'm talking about. Yes, I'm here. So your last statement was actually a perfect segue into what I'm going to talk about. So I wouldn't be here without the internet. <laughs> I'm in here as an entrepreneur who started, you know, her venture with very limited funding and was able to just grow it over, over a decade. Um, I monitor your venture, so I know. <laughs> Thank you, sir. The same thing with, with us, with this gathering, we're here on Zoom. And we're here on Zoom because of the technology that it has been able to present for us to use. And I want to address the technology question because Nigeria, I would say we have the vision here. So oftentimes when I hear governors speaking or even other people within the government are saying, oh, we're doing this online, online is good, this is nice. However, beyond the vision, the execution and the enabling environment is still restrictive. And this cuts across every possible sector. If you look at Estonia, so if you're really into the digital world, Estonia is now like the world's gold standard for like digital government, for example. About 99% of their government requests can be done digitally online. And this even includes voting. Some may argue like, ah, America has not even done evils in England hasn't done. But if you go back to what we we're talking about, what you just mentioned now with FinTech, there are a lot of things I could transfer money more easily in Nigeria three years ago than I could in America. So there are a lot of ways that we've been able to leapfrog this Western world. And I feel like this is such an amazing opportunity. You addressed many of the ills in our continent in your, in your talk. Um, and corruption is such a big part of it. And we've seen that with open government, more transparency, use of digital tools, a lot of this can be cut down. Finally, I want to talk about, you know, we talk about digital and it's powerful, but I want to talk about unintended consequences and putting structures in place to 
mitigate that ahead of rolling these things out. So data security and data rights is such a big issue. So for example, if you're telling me to give my information for BVN or for my new passports or for my new driver's license, that information needs to be secure and the government definitely needs to put clear and transparent legislation around it to ensure that it is. So as we progress towards this, which is very powerful, um, definitely this is a focus area that I haven't seen enough of. And also for your states, I know that definitely in the terms that you have done so far, I've heard of several innovative projects and I commend you for that. Uh, I'll also add that there is, you know, something <laughs> we learned in change theory at Harvard around shrinking the change. And I just want to emphasize that power of shrinking the change by using your state as a model that can be emulated by others around the country, similar to what MI had mentioned. So with digital, I know we are doing a lot of farming, a lot of education, but that definitely should be at the forefront of the agenda. Excellent. Right. Uh, yeah. Uche, I, 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 I thank you for those comments. Incidentally, I know, I know quite a bit about Estonia. I have Estonians uh, working with us in AKT. Cybernetic is uh, partnering with us in some of our initiatives. So uh, absolutely, I, I, I'm aware of that. But the unintended consequences, I couldn't fall that argument. There's a lot of it, and we need to become more aware of it. And I think it speaks to the earlier question by uh, Femi on intellectual property rights as well, uh, because because we're not familiar with this thing. We're, we're just sort of chatting in the dark uh, and trying to figure out what are the cyber uh, techniques and uh, internet uh, legal frameworks to develop that would help us respond to these issues that, that you mentioned, because there are unintended consequences that come with it, uh, including uh, cyberbullying, cyberterrorism, and uh, uh, safety of your records and, and, and information. But I also think those of you who are experts in the field, you are beginning to also assist with that. The government has very limited knowledge but it's increasing, I can assure you, particularly with regards to data uh, protection. Uh, uh, and I think it can only get better uh, in future. Uh, as for shrinking the change, I, I spoke about peer learning. In, in the governor's forum, we have what we call the peer review process in which we benefit from one another. Uh, what Lagos is doing much better than AKT, we send our officials to Lagos to go and learn and what it is uh, an exemplar of, we get other states to come and, and also benefit from that knowledge. Uh, we need to do more of that, but we, 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 we recognize the importance of, of shrinking the change. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Um, I just want to say, uh, I want to invite the host for his questions before I go on. It's gone on for so long. But I thought I should use the opportunity of Uche's uh, excellent point about Estonia to draw home a point. One is that if you take a look at Estonia, which I had studied very well, uh, from the 1583s, uh, you recall that it was part of the Swedish Empire, really. Uh, it wasn't until uh, 1721 that it was ceded to Russia, and it declared independence in 1918. Now, this technology, digital capital, you talk about it is that he did not become powerful because he, he, he invented technology, really. In fact, it will be interesting to go and study what it is. In fact, he has almost a similar experience like Ekiti. So his excellency will be a problem right now to begin not to compare himself to Dubai, but to think about Estonia and see how he can actually turn professorship and agriculture into the same thing. For example, Ghana is beginning to use technologies in agriculture. Nobody talks about subsistence farming anymore. They talk about the business of agriculture. So, uh, Uche, you are absolutely on point, but it's important for me to draw the point home to His Excellency that, yes, these things are achievable, and it's not just an overnight success thing, and that, in fact, nobody even knew that he was that powerful until they had a digital security crisis to almost two years ago that made everybody pay attention to understand that even Skype was actually built from Estonia before everybody knew about it. In fact, a town in... Estonia, I can't pronounce it, but I think it's Lillian or something, something. Talia, Tallinn, 
is now the Silicon Valley of Europe, not London, not Germany, not whatever, which tells us that in Africa, we yeah. are actually creating huge things. If you know, if you know what is happening with CC Urban Code. So Mr. Frank, we'd like to bring you in yes. here to well, ask questions. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Your Excellency. Thank you, uh, panelists. I mean, I think um, such an excellent uh, conversation we've had. I'm going to digress completely. I'm going to digress completely <laughs> because, because I am one of those that believe that even this panelist, His Excellency, the governor, myself sitting out here, and perhaps a lot of the people who have opportunities to even log on to this Zoom call, I, I would consider that we are privileged. I'll consider that we're very privileged. So the bulk Absolutely. of our compatriots all over this country, the bulk of our citizens, the young people of this country, are either unemployed, they're poor, they're either working for criminal gangs, or they are either trying to migrate out of this country, one thing or the other. So I would like us to, I'm going to take up His Excellency the Governor on what I consider to be first principle, right? So government, government, government. Yes, there's no doubt that government has a huge role to play in, in nation building. But I'm interested, sir, in discussing your youth policy. Youth policy in the context of, okay, or education in the context of youth policy. What is, how are you trying to really ensure equity in terms of access to education, in terms of access to uh, skills opportunities, in terms of health care, right, access to health care, in terms of maternal and child uh, care. Because um, you and I know that parenting has a very important role to play as well in how a child turns out, either now or in the future. So it is through that health care policy that you can ensure that both the mothers get maternal care, the children get access to early childhood education that actually prepares them for the future, prepares them to then benefit from some of the very important policies that you've really uh, uh, articulately uh, you know, stated in your, uh, your, your well-written uh, uh, keynote address. So I'm really, really interested in knowing this. How are we going to really ensure that we pull up most of our young people and you know, prepare them to take opportunity or take advantage of some of the things that you now um, um, for instance, if you are looking at the issue of women, I've often stated, I mean, I have, for me, I have a particular bias for, for, for mothers. Why is this? You notice that through conception, through gestation, through childbirth, through breastfeeding, through nurture, they are the ones closest to the family. They are the ones closest to the children. And so if there was a deliberate policy to make sure that the health care that they need at any point in time, that they have access to it, and that they are supported with skills with other empowerment programs to nurture these children properly. I believe we can have better outcomes in terms of quality of our young people. And then, of course, their productive capacity. Those would be my, uh, my comments. And I'd like to listen to this. Uh, Frank, thank you very much for taking us away from the realm of privilege to the realm of reality, because that's what you just did. It's a reality <laughs> check. That's where the people are. Uh, uh, and um, you're absolutely right that government cannot be government if you don't respond to the yearnings of the greater majority of your population. Let me say that in terms of education, our, our, our youth policy is to guarantee access to every young person. So we're running free education, free compulsory education uh, policy in Ekiti State right up to senior secondary school three. The, the federal uh, free education program ends in, ends in JSS three, but we've extended ours to SSS three. And in addition to that, what we've done is to insist that you must be in school. So we enforce very strictly our Child Rights Act in the state. So you can hardly come across kids in Ekiti State hawking uh, in public during school hours. If you do, the government will bring the maximum weight of the law on your head as a parent. Because we'll pick you up and you take us to your uh, guardian or parent uh, who would have to explain why you are not in school. So as a result of this, we have 
our enrollment rate is one of the highest in the country. So that's, that's uh, something that we take seriously. But we also, since I returned, have prioritized vocational and technical education. And enrollment has also increased exponentially for those who are interested in skills development in those uh, artisanal uh, uh, or, or technical level. Uh, and, and, and we we are putting more effort uh, in this regard. This also speaks to our health program, uh, Frank, which is we, we, we have a health insurance scheme in the state that caters to the needs of the vulnerable. And we also have a social investment program uh, which started from my first time in office for the elderly. So we pay a stipend uh, to the elderly over uh, 65 who do not have uh, people who are looking after them. Uh, and uh, we complement that with what we call Onji Arugbo. Our Arugbo is complemented by Onji Arugbo in which we make available uh, food stuff and also food bank uh, in, in the state to, to protect people in, in that regard. But coming back to, 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 to your point about maternal and child mortality, the priority of our focus of our health system is primary health, uh, understandably, because we have a lot of rural communities. Yes, we have tertiary health institutions and we have uh, specialist hospitals, general hospitals in all our local governments, but we've prioritized at least one primary health center in every ward of our 177 wards, and we're equipping all of them uh, 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 appropriately to respond to the demands of the particular uh, population in the world, in addition to also increasing the number of, of employees, because that's where the challenge lies. Sometimes the, the turnover of employees in the health sector is so huge because of the availability of opportunities in Canada and other places. So we have to keep retraining and looking for people to fill these uh, vacant positions uh, from time to time. But I'm glad you, you, you spoke about the place of women in all of this. In Ekiti, everybody knows that we have zero tolerance for the oppression of women, uh, either directly, uh, directly through gender-based violence or indirectly through policies of government. Uh, on youth, we insist that even teenage pregnancy should not be uh, a devouring of you're going to school. So we, we, we encourage the girl child who may have uh, uh, become pregnant in the course of going to school to return to school. And, and the Office of the Wife of Governor really focuses on this. Um, we also insist on, on protecting our uh, female children, our girl children uh, from a whole range of gender-based violence issues that we've been dealing with in the state. It's not unique to us, but we've taken a, a, a very firm view of these issues, which is why for, for, for young women who have suffered this, we have sexual assault referral centers uh, set up, we have shelters and transit home for them and skill acquisition centers. We've provided all this because we see a direct correlation between protecting our women and protecting our state because they play a far more central role in nurturing and our development uh, our process in, in, in the state. So for us, education and healthcare are the centerpiece of our social investment strategy. And we uh, spend the bulk of our budget on these two issues. Okay, Your Excellency, um, I can assure you that I have over, I'm sure you can see the questions as well. You can see the chat. And you can see that even people like Professor Akpadeku has started with us from the beginning. And uh, he has restrained himself from asking questions, uh, choosing to pass it through uh, parties. I have Clem Baye here of the Nigerian Communications Commission. I have people from the Office of the National Security. <laughs> I have ordinary Nigerians, including Kede Ahe, who asked, a governor fire should also get the Estonia company to share knowledge with his local university. Indeed, 
The entire budget allocation yeah. for education in Nigeria for 2029 came in at $1.7 billion, which critics pointed out was 15% below the minimum level recommended for developing countries. Uh, and it's, it's used that point to drive up the point that you spent your major part of your career uh, as a development economist and consultant across the nation. So we can continue uh, the conversations as much as we want. But having to commit two hours of your executive time, uh, for me, has been a rather uh, a bold statement on your willingness to engage and your ability to also take my first question about feedback more than too seriously. It would therefore give me a pleasure to try to draw this thing to a close, acknowledging everybody who, uh, to a close, acknowledging everybody who has participated, and hand over to my host, Mr. Pakiweke, who will take the rest of the 10 minutes as he chooses. Uh, and so we wrap up at exactly 12 noon. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. And thank you, Uche. Thank you, Jude. Thank you, Miriam. And over to you, Mr. Frank Weke. Thank you, Femi. Well, um, thank you very much, uh, Femi. It's always a delight to uh, watch you or listen to your moderate. I mean, you've been in your elements as always. Thank you so much for making this conversation and so well worth it. Of course, I will join you and the entire members of my executive committee in thanking His Excellency the Governor. Uh, your Excellency, you are a Harvard alumni. And uh, um, I think that uh, our, your, your, uh, what you've done today, this morning, your delivery, the content, the, um, the, your response to the questions and how you've engaged you know, again, speaks to your affiliation with Harvard University. And I just want to thank you so much. Of course, uh, Uche, uh, MI, um, Maria, thank you so much. I mean, we have for several panelists, young Nigerians who, um, you know, uh, really taken on the, on the challenges they've had in their lives and then made a success of it, waiting for government, not waiting for anyone. But again, um, I believe that it was possible for all of you to do what you've done so far in your life and because of the nurture you received. I'm very, very big on parenting. I'm very, very big on the partnership between government and citizens. I really don't think that national, uh, sorry, nation building is the, is the role of government alone. So I just want to thank you so much for the excellent contributions. Um, in the coming days, we are going to issue a position paper based on the keynote address provided by His Excellency, and then the very deep insights that uh, uh, all of you have shared in your various uh, commentaries. Now, we have a couple of people uh, online. I believe that um, Aminu Mukhtar, the Vice President of the Harvard Alumni Association of Nigeria, is online. And um, Aminu, can you, uh, Aminu, can you just indicate your, your, your presence, please? Aminu Mukhtar. Aminu Mukhtar, can you just indicate your presence, please? Aminu Mukhtar, are you, are you still with us? Okay, well. Um, Aminu, okay, I think we're having difficulty in really getting him or just having him uh, come on. But um, I would like to, again, Call on uh, if Professor Epo is still online. Professor Epo, are you still online? Professor Epo, if you're online, please just indicate by raise of your hand. Can you see him? Professor Epo, are you there? Professor, well, please, if you're online, just uh, wave and then just a very brief comment, two, two minutes, just before we yeah. sign off. Yes, uh, I enjoyed the event. Thank you very much. I enjoyed the keynote speech and the panelists, uh, their thoughts. I think uh, the point was made uh, about education and health. Uh, once yes. you miss that in an economy, then the economy is in trouble. So we have to make sure that uh, we take serious education and health and i think maybe next time we should dig deeper into that subject education and health uh in order to put in place uh robust policies so that our youths can uh, 
benefit from the resources in Nigeria and abroad. Thank you very much. It's been a wonderful event. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, so um, uh, if you want to raise your hand, mind, please click the raise your hand button. Has he raised his hand? Okay, it's not there. Well, it's rather nice to have uh, my uh, colleague on the executive committee of uh, the Alumni Association, Alice, offer some uh, remarks, uh, but he may have left early for some reason. Uh, on this note, I'd like to just reaffirm my thanks again and just, you know, thank you all for an amazing session. I wish you a great weekend and we look forward to having you on, uh, on uh, future events. Thank you so much. Well, Your Excellency, before you go, you know, as an alumni, well, okay, let me not let me not say that one. As an alumni, we have certain responsibilities you have to fulfill, but I'll send you a private chat on that one. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Best wishes for a fantastic day. Thank you.